Welcome to this video on Meniere's disease. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What is Meniere's disease and how does this differ from Meniere's syndrome? What symptoms may be seen and why? How would you investigate and diagnose Meniere's disease? And how would you treat this condition? Meniere's disease refers to a triad of intermittent episodic vertigo, hearing loss and tinnitus often accompanied by aural fullness. This is thought to be due to endolymphatic hydrops, an excessive buildup of endolymph. The reason why this occurs is unknown, but thought to relate to disruptions in the microcirculation of the ear, resulting in altered homeostasis of the endolymph. However, when this process occurs secondary to a known inner ear disorder, such as trauma, infections or otosclerosis, this is termed Meniere's syndrome. Endolymph is the fluid that bathes the sensory cells in both the organ of balance and the cochlear duct. It is produced by the stria vascularis of the ear. These endolymph-filled spaces communicate with the endolymphatic sac, which regulates the volume and pressure of endolymph, removes inner ear waste products, and provides an immunological function. In contrast with perilymph, endolymph contains high concentrations of potassium, which is essential for the normal functioning of the hair cells. With high drops, these endolymph-containing spaces become distended, causing the sensation of aural fullness. In addition, the distended scala media results in a sensory hearing loss and or tinnitus. This may be because of an altered fluid dynamic through the deformed space, but potentially also from degradation of surrounding spiral ganglion cells. Often the symptoms are limited to the hearing organ alone, which is termed cochlear high drops, and not all patients with high drops will develop Meniere's disease. In some cases, the endolymphatic pressure can increase and cause a breach in Riesner's membrane, which separates the perilymph from the endolymph. The resulting mix in perilymph and endolymph causes a temporary hearing loss and vertigo until the membrane is repaired and the normal composition of the endolymph has been restored. This can be between 20 minutes to four hours, but usually not longer than a day. Patients may also report drop attacks where they have a sudden fall without loss of consciousness. This is thought to relate to a mechanical deformation of the otolith organs, causing a burst of neural activity, activating the vestibulospinal reflex. Patients may also report nausea and vomiting with Meniere's disease. Meniere's is a difficult condition to diagnose, particularly because few patients exhibit all of the classical Meniere's symptoms, and there is a lot of overlap between these symptoms and other conditions including vestibular migraines and other balance disorders. Audiometry may reveal a sensory loss which is typically in the lower frequencies. An MRI scan of the internal audiometrius can be performed to rule out an alternative pathology. More recently there is a specific protocol designed to identify cases of high drops. This involves administration of IV gadolinium followed by a delayed MRI to allow time for the gadolinium to penetrate the inner ear. This scan may demonstrate distension of the scala media and compression of the perilymph spaces. While these investigations are helpful, ultimately the diagnosis is based on the American Academy criteria, which outlines the symptoms required for a definitive or probable many years diagnosis. The treatment is stepwise and includes lifestyle measures, medical treatments or surgery, which can either preserve or destroy hearing. Alcohol and caffeine can result in changes to inner ear microcirculation, and so avoiding these is recommended. Similarly, salt restriction is also theorized to improve control of the volume and composition of endolymph. Thiazide diuretics can be helpful and work by reducing fluid retention, which may in turn reduce the degree of high drops. Beta histine is a histamine agonist on the H1 receptor, which are located in the inner ear blood vessels. This results in localized vasodilation, which is thought to improve high drops. Although it's often prescribed for many years, double-blind randomized controlled trials have not demonstrated a significant improvement in symptom control compared to placebo. A short course of repeated intratympanic steroids can also help to control symptoms. The dose and frequency of these administrations vary by center. A typical regime includes three dosages of either methylprednisolone or dexamethasone administered at three to seven day intervals. 
For patients with poor hearing, intratympanic gentamicin can be used. This preferentially ablates the vestibular system, but should be reserved to cases where there is poor residual hearing. Surgical treatments can either preserve or destroy residual hearing. Hearing preservation options include ventilation tube placement, which in some cases can be useful for aural fullness, though again the evidence remains poor. A variety of operations have been proposed on the endolymphatic sac. These include sac decompression, ablation or ligation of the endolymphatic duct. All of these should preserve hearing, but are supported by limited evidence. Finally, dividing the vestibular nerve can reduce vestibular symptoms while preserving hearing. In cases where the hearing is poor, you can consider an osseous labyrinthectomy. This involves destroying the organ of balance and hearing, and should only be considered when there is no serviceable hearing. Involvement of the wider multidisciplinary team is important for the management of these patients. Audiology can be helpful to treat any hearing loss with hearing aids and also to provide tinnitus counselling if this is bothersome. Vestibular rehabilitation can also help patients with generalised disequilibrium and oftentimes these patients have significant psychological impact of these symptoms and so may benefit from dedicated psychological support. Vestibular sedatives should be used with caution. These work by sedating the vestibular apparatus and reducing the aberrant signals from the affected ear. However, an important part of managing this condition is habituation and compensation, and so overuse of this can impair this process. I hope you found this video to be useful. Please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.